Hello, a very good morning and welcome along to your Midweek Ireland AM. It is Wednesday, the 19th of October. Now on today's show, we have got acclaimed actors. We also have award-winning judges plus home heating hacks. We all need those. First up, the gangland court case of the century is underway. We bring you the latest from the trial of Jerry the Monk Hutch. Now, unsolicited nude pictures will soon be a thing of the past. I'll believe it when I see it. We hear how social media companies will be fined for failing to remove cyber flashing images. Cyber a flashing. Little bit. Little bit. You a cyber, do you receive cyber flashers? No. I no, don't he doesn't want, really want to get into it. Doesn't want to get into uh, it. Plus, Dublin actor Sandy Townsend shares behind the scenes secrets from his new Star Wars series. Alan, what else have we got this morning? Well, Murren, he showed off his brand new television award, National Television Award, on Saturday. Strictly dancer turned judge Anton Dubeck joins us after nine. Looking forward to that. And, uh, well, let's uh, get the latest on the weather front. Derek, a status orange rain warning still in place. How are going to be people impacted Absolutely. over the next few hours? Absolutely, Al. I have to say horrendous driving conditions coming out on the road here this morning in County West Me. We've that status orange weather warning in place for five counties, Cork, Kerry, Waterford, Wexford and into County Wicklow. But elsewhere, a status yellow for many parts of Leinster. We're looking at some very heavy thundery rain and again because of that heavy rain that, that ongoing risk of spot flooding. So if you are out and about on the roads today, conditions are going to be very, very dangerous. So do take extra care. We'll have more on that over the next wee while. Thanks very much, Jerry. Yeah, it Honestly, the M50 was frightening this morning. It was yeah. crazy, yeah, the surface water. So be careful and maybe take your time, leave a little bit earlier yeah. if you can. Speaking of the cold weather, we also have some home heating hacks that will keep your energy costs down. Well, right now, it's time to go over to the Virgin Media News Hub and say hello to the first time this morning to Hannah Murphy. Thank you, Mirren, and good morning. Well, the central bank is expected to announce tweaks to the mortgage lending rules today. Lenders and brokers have for years insisted they're too restrictive at a time of an intense housing crisis. For the last seven years, prospective home buyers have been limited to borrowing up to three and a half times their salary unless they can get an exemption and they're required to have a 20% deposit or 10% if they're a first-time buyer. The central bank has been carrying out a review of the mortgages for the last year and it's understood the regulator will make an announcement on the future of lending rules later this morning. Met Aaron is warning of disruption and localised flooding in the south and southeast of the country today. A status orange rain alert is in place for counties Cork, Kerry, Waterford, Wexford and Wicklow until midnight, with thundery downpours expected. Homeowners and businesses were urged to take precautions before the alert kicked in late last night. A yellow rain warning is also in place across the east of the country, the Midlands and Borders counties Monaghan and Cavan. Liz Truss is due to face a grilling at Prime Minister's questions this afternoon amid growing pressure over her leadership. Since sacking her Chancellor and appointing a new one, many of the huge tax cuts in her mini-budget have been reversed and the Prime Minister has had to apologise for the mistakes that have been made. The announcement on September 23rd sparked economic and political turmoil, pushing up borrowing costs, raising home mortgage rates and sending the pound plummeting to an all-time low against the dollar. Today, all eyes will be on the new Prime Minister as she's confronted by the opposition. It's got to be a matter of days at this point. I think um, we're basically the laughing stock of the entire world, as per usual. Um, I think it's quite shambolic. I wouldn't be surprised if every single other Tory backbencher is writing their letter of uh, vote no confidence in the, next, in the coming days. I, I guess my big question is what is the point of the Conservative Party at the moment? Um, you know, it's the party of uh, economic stability normally, and it's lost all credibility at the moment. I think Liz Truss will be gone by the end of the week. In Australia, thousands of people across the southeast of the country are bracing themselves for further flooding, with more heavy rain forecast later this week. It comes after serious flooding caused extensive damage in the same areas last weekend. Claire Regan has more. It's all hands on deck in the town of Etuka in northern Victoria. It lies on the banks of the River Murray, Australia's longest river, which straddles the border between Victoria and New South Wales. The river could hit a 30-year high this week with more downpours forecast. Residents have been working around the clock to build a dam in a bid to protect their homes. People are sandbagging. We don't know 
we honestly don't, they don't know where the water level's going to be. They're hopeful it'll stop rising water in the coming days, but there are fears up to 2,000 homes could be impacted. I'm trying to save my property because I'm on the Bronx side of the levee bank. Heavy rains are expected to hit Etchuka on Friday, which means the River Murray could peak by Sunday. Claire Regan, Virgin Media News. Actor Kevin Spacey has finished five hours of testifying in a sexual misconduct trial in the US. Anthony Rapp, a fellow actor, accused the Oscar winner of trying to seduce him in the 1980s when Rapp was just 14. When the allegations were made in 2017, Kevin Spacey issued a statement saying he didn't remember the incident but apologised anyway. Yesterday, he told the court he was coerced to make that statement by his publicity team and denied the encounter ever happened. And finally, Netflix has revealed details about how it plans to crack down on password sharing. It involves charging users a small fee to create a sub-account for their friends and family. The streaming giant has been trialling the measure in Chile, Costa Rica and Peru since March. During the company's earning report yesterday, where it reported better than expected results, Netflix said the extra member feature will be broadly implemented in 2023. For car insurance, van insurance, or home insurance, call the Quote Devil. Unless, of course, you've got money to burn. Thank you very much, Emery. We're coming to you live here from Devlin in County West. Me, we've got Oshie Moore with us on cameras this morning. Get, let's get that right in to that status on rainfall warning at the moment for counties Cork, Kerry, into Waterford, Wexford, and County Wicklow. Now, we are also looking at a status yellow rainfall warning for counties Lee, Shoffley, Carlock, and Kenny, and into County Tip. Now, we're looking at very, very heavy rain. We do have that system feeding up from the south at the moment. Some torrential rain in parts of some rain activity as well thrown in for good measure with an ongoing risk of spot flooding now right across this afternoon in fact uh, those winds are going to pick up pace it will be fresh to strong locally gusty from the east and again that's going to drive up more rain in that northerly direction now again we're looking at that ongoing risk of spot flooding that status orange uh, rainfall warning remaining in place for those five counties until midnight tonight top values today in and around 11 to 15 degrees finally then tonight more of that rain feeding up across the country again it's going to be heavy at times of ongoing risk of thunderstorm activity now towards the back end of the night really into tomorrow morning that's where we're going to get a little bit of a breather because we're going to see those winds slacken and uh, an improving picture as we wake up into your thursday but for now torrential rain here in devlin in county westmeath and we'll catch you back live at 7 35. For first-time drivers, young drivers, returning drivers, if you've had an open claim or have had too many penalty points. The quote devil's always got one hell of a quote. It's time now to take a look at today's papers. We'll start with the Irish Times. Its headline, mortgage lending rules set to be eased. The central bank and government are set to make major interventions in the state's housing market with mortgage lending rules expected to be eased, allowing house hunters to borrow four times more than their income. Mortgage lending rules change to combat rising interest rates. That's the front page of the Irish Independent. The current limits in place since 2015 restricted lenders to offering loans of up to three and a half times annual income to most borrowers. Most, uh, we'll have more on that story before eight o'clock. Buying time on housing is the top story on the Daily Mail. The cabinet has also signed off on a winter eviction ban to counter the cost of living crisis. Moving on now, and the rest of the papers lead with the trial of Jerry the Monk Hutch. The examiner leads with Hutch said he was one of the team. The special criminal court heard Hutch told former Sinn Féin councillor Jonathan Dowdell that he was one of the team that murdered Kinahan gang member David Byrne at Dublin's Regency Hotel in 2016. The Sun's front page reads, Monk was on a six-man Regency hit team. The Herald's headline, a burn's face had been blown off. A boxing official has described the mayhem of the Regency Hotel shooting. The Star's front page, Monk was on hit squad. And finally, the Mirror's main headline is Monk on Regency hit team. Hutch has pleaded not guilty to the murder of David Byrne. Uh, coming up after the break, we're going to bring you up to speed on the gangland trial of the century. We'll see you after this.
Now there's tight guard and security at the special criminal court as the trial of Jerry the Monk Hutch has finally got underway. Armed police members of the underworld and a fascinated public will all converge on the Dublin courthouse over the coming weeks. Here to discuss is criminologist John Dean O'Keefe and News Talks courts correspondent Frank Graney. Frank, we will go to you first. Of course, we have to be careful because this is an ongoing court case. So this is based on um, the murder uh, in 2016. Can you just bring us up to why we're, why we're in the special criminal court with Jerry Hutch? Well, it's hard to believe, but it's almost been seven years now since these events unfolded in the Regency Hotel in Dublin. Um, on the 5th of February 2016, at about two o'clock in the afternoon, a boxing weigh-in was taking place at the hotel. We heard yesterday in Sean Galan, the prosecuting barrister's opening address to the court, that at about two o'clock that afternoon, a van uh, pulled up outside a security gate um, beside the hotel. Um, we heard that two men then entered the laundry room entrance of the hotel. One of them was wearing a wig and dressed as a woman. And um, the other person was a slightly older man, we heard, uh, wearing a flat cap. They could be seen moving through the hotel, moving towards the suite where this boxing event was taking place. They were armed with handguns. Um, we heard that panic ensued. Um, people were running for their lives. Shots were fired. At about 2.29 p.m., we heard the van moved to the front of the hotel near the main entrance. We heard that three men armed with assault rifles then entered through the main entrance of the hotel. While this was all going on, the van did a U-turn. It pointed back towards the direction that it came from, and we heard that it left its side door open while this panic ensued inside. Obviously, the people who entered the hotel caused more confusion and panic because they were dressed for all intents and purposes. They look like armed guardi, and you can imagine the confusion within the hotel when they started to open fire. Um, ultimately, we heard that um, David Byrne's life was obviously uh, taken that day. Um, he could be seen on CCTV footage running from uh, the suite where the boxing wane was taking place, and he was shot then by one of the members of this tactical team in the reception area. Another member of that tactical team then shot him too. Uh, this person described yesterday in court as tactical two, jumped the desk um, at reception. There was a person cowering, hiding. Um, he pointed the gun at this person for a moment, didn't fire, and went back over the desk and walked coldly and calmly over to David Byrne and shot him a number of times in the head and body. He was shot six times. He died at the scene. And that's why we're all here talking about this today, because just over a year ago, Jerry the Monk Hutch was extradited from Spain. He was charged with David Byrne's murder. He has pleaded not guilty to that charge. So we know that it's in the special criminal court, not just a typical jury court. What's the reason for that? Well, put simply, the Director of Public Prosecutions decided that this was a case that couldn't be adequately dealt with before a judge and jury in the ordinary court. So three judges, no jury, will decide on the facts of this case. Now, Jerry Hutch did challenge that through the courts, and he has spent some time unsuccessfully, I might add, um, challenging the jurisdiction of the Special Criminal Court to hear this case. The Special Criminal Court was set up to, to hear terror, terrorist-related cases, but over the years it has probably become a lot busier for gangland-related trials. Uh, Jerry Hutch went all the way to the Supreme Court, again challenging the jurisdiction of this court to hear his to hear his case, um, but he lost. Um, you know, there were arguments in, in the past when the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court is challenged, it's often because of a fear that juries may be threatened or bribed or influenced in some way. So this is taking place now and will take place for about three months before three judges of the Special Criminal Court. Uh, the barristers yesterday were putting forth their cases as to what uh, the judges are going to hear over the coming weeks in relation to this. And there there were some 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 new things, I think, that's in the front of all the papers uh, in relation to what, what we're going to hear, uh, Frank. Yeah. Um, so the big talking points from yesterday would obviously be the state's case against Jerry Hutch because, you know, up until now, we have known for some time that he is charged with um, the murder of David Byrne, but we didn't know what the specific allegation against him was. So when Sean Galan gave the court yesterday an overview of the case that he intends to present uh, over the coming months, we got a flavour of what that case against Mr. Hutch is. And you have to look at some of the events that unfolded in the lead up to this shooting. You know, earlier this week, we had a former Sinn Féin councillor called Jonathan and Dowdall and his father, Patrick Dowdall, sentenced, sentenced for their roles in what happened that day. They pleaded guilty to a charge of facilitating the murder of David Byrne by making a hotel room 
at the Regency available to the criminal organisation behind it. Now, there are two strands to the prosecution's case against Jerry Hutch, just from what Mr Gillan said to the court yesterday. Uh, firstly, he is accused of meeting Jonathan Dowdall the night before the Regency attack, supposedly to collect key cards that his father had got from reception when he went in to pay for the room in cash. These key cards, we heard, it will be alleged, were then used by one of the gunmen at the following day. Now, Sometime after the Regency shooting, we heard that it will again be alleged that Jerry Hutch requested a meeting with Jonathan Dowdall in a park in Whitehall in Dublin. And this was on the back of a photograph, quite a famous photograph at this point, that was published on the front page of the Sunday World, showing two of the supposed raiders at the hotel, the man with the wig dressed as a woman, and also the man who was being referred to in court as flat cap. Now, Mr. Galan said yesterday in his opening address that um, the court will in due course hear evidence that Jerry Hutch was, was on edge, was edgy, I think was the exact word that he used, and quite worked up at this meeting with Jonathan Dowdall where he is alleged to have indicated to Jonathan Dowdhall that he was actually a part of that team that shot David Byrne. We heard it will also be alleged that he asked Jonathan Dowdall to arrange for a meeting with his Republican contacts in the North. And this was because of the fear of an escalation of, of the feud that we now know um, existed between the Kinnahans and the Hutches. He was concerned about some threats to his family. We heard that on the 7th of March then, 2016, he and Jonathan Dowdall drove to Straban in County Tyrone. Mr. Galan said yesterday that their car was under surveillance. Uh, conversations were recorded. They talked about many things. And Mr. Galan said that, again, in due course, the judges will hear about conversations they had in relation to the Regency Hotel and related matters, in relation to the feud with the Kinnahans and the possibility of a ceasefire. In, now, it's... it is important to point out that while this took some time, this was a lengthy and complex um, opening on behalf of the prosecution yesterday. It wasn't evidence. This was just his overview yeah. of the case. He'll have to prove that beyond a reasonable doubt I mean, over the coming months. It's absolutely fascinating mm. stuff, Frank. And we know that this court case is going to go on for a considerable period of time. And I know you're going to be going there again this morning. So, uh, Frank Grady, thank you so much for joining us this morning, of course, court correspondent. Um, we're also joined by criminologist John Dean O'Keefe as well. John, we see, see pictures there a lot of Jonathan Dowdall. We mm. know that he got convicted of uh, he's been sentenced to four years in prison, yes. maximum security prison. Yeah, he turned state witness, but because he has done this and he has turned almost mm -hmm. from what we see on the monk. I mean, what what will maximum security prison look like for Jonathan? Yeah. Well, first of all, Portleash is actually technically a high security prison, which it might seem like a marginal difference. It really is maximum security, so it's this, it's equivalent of the highest security in the United States, they would call them supermax prisons. Why? Well, because they've got 100 uh, soldiers at any one time, two platoons, they've got rifles, they've got anti-aircraft uh, submachine guns. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, perimeters, all, all the usual stuff you'd expect. In fact, there's a, a no-fly zone uh, above, above the jail. So this is a serious jail. I mean, this is like nothing we have really in Europe, and it's considered the most secure in Europe. Mm. There has been talk recently, this mind you. It's the most secure prison in Europe. It's, it's reckoned to be the most secure prison in Europe and would match wow. anything in the United States. But John, Jonathan Dowdall's issue, and perhaps Patrick Dowdall's issue, is that they will be living uh, in a prison within a prison. Yeah. So it really will be super max. So they will be... I mean, it's a bad image, but it's the one that comes to mind, which is Hannibal Lecter. You know, they're not going to be literally in a cage, but they're going to be like that, where there are layers outside them, because they have to be kept away from absolutely everybody yeah. for fairly obvious reasons. And, of course, the cost of that is going to be through the roof. Well, that's... I was just reading, sorry, that could cost up to a million a year oh, yeah. for well, one well, person. You work it out. Like, you're, it's 200,000 for a prisoner on average in Port Leash. 100,000 in a regular prison, so about 200,000 with all the extra security, with the type of security they're both going to need. I mean, just even by the way that there will be armed police within the prison looking after them 24-7, yeah. you've got to be looking at around a million ahead. I think there's a huge argument to be having in relation to what we do to... The money we spend on preventative measures to send people to prison and what we spend on a per prisoner. Uh, that's for a different day. Sure. But uh, where is Jerry the Munkoch going to be? He obviously knows people who are going to be, who are in Portlaoise Prison. Mm. Like, this is why they have to be kept like this. Yeah, well, it's... They're it's not going to be the same prison, are they? Well, it seems unlikely. I mean, where else is he going to go? He's, he's not going to go to an open prison, you know? And it is our most secure prison in Ireland, and he will have to be a prisoner within the prison 
and kept absolutely away from everybody else. This is a small country. It's going to be very, very difficult to keep these people. If he's found guilty, this is what's going to happen. And if he's found guilty, he will get, like everybody gets if they're found guilty, of murder, the mandatory life sentence. He has pleaded not guilty, of course. Of course course, he has. What could this mean for the criminal underworld in Ireland? This court case and everything surrounding it? I would say in terms of the upper ends of the criminal uh, gangs in Ireland, it's got to be the end of them. This is really massive. And the work the Irish police and Garda Siakon have done here has been unreal and unrivaled. I know we ever talks about that. It's been incredible. This is the breakdown of the really large organised gang and or gangs. Uh, because, of course, people are getting nervous now. And Jonathan Dowdall, of course, we've talked about him here before, going state witness, yeah. is a real turning point. Because now that may become a contagion amongst uh, the criminal gangs. But does it not leave a vacuum? Like, we always see, you know, who drugs were were controlled by in Ireland up until, you know, certain things happened in the 90s, these fires and everything. And then these criminal gangs started to emerge in yeah, the course. 90s. And a vacuum... Leaves a vacuum. Yeah, of course. Leaves a vacuum. No, so I'm not suggesting, look, this is cyclical. And because if, if I'm right about the Kinhan organisation and associated organisations, they may dissipate, but others will fill their place. What I'm saying is, and Garda Shia Khan now have a way of dealing with it. A precedent has been set, and this is going to unsettle them. So I think, we're, my, my own personal opinion is, we're not going to see the same size of gangs and the same magnitude of global gangs here in the near future, near to medium future. It's, it is fascinating, and it's going to be fascinating over the coming weeks. Uh, criminologist John D. O'Keefe, thank you so much for joining us. I'm not sure if Frank Graney is still with us as well, but it's great to have that update. Yeah, it'll be going on for quite a while, and I'm sure we'll be talking to both yourself and Frank again in relation to this. And shortly we round up round up the rest of the stories that are making today's papers. Plus, sending nudes is set to become a criminal offence. We're going to talk about... Two sides of a very different coin there, really. Cyber flash, well, equally very dangerous, yeah. We're going to talk about cyber flashing next. Welcome back to the show. Now, as unfortunately many people know, unsolicited nude pictures are sadly the norm these days. But new legislation is set to tackle online flashing. Political correspondent with the Irish Sun, Adam Higgins, and cyber psychologist Nicola Fox Hamilton join us. Good morning to you both. Uh, Adam, let's start with yourselves. Online flashing, cyber flashing. First, what, what is it? So this is the original uh, idea to include this in the legislation actually started during the pandemic when uh, you might remember everything moved into Zoom and then there was reports of uh, if you had like a Zoom yoga class or a Zoom council meeting, someone was hacking in and exposing themselves to to everybody on it. Mm -hmm. So that's originally where the idea came from to include this in the legislation for the new media commission. But it does also include then, for example, sending uh, unsolicited or unwanted um, sexual pictures to people in direct messages on social media and things like that. So that's where it all came from. So uh, currently, if someone sends a picture, an unsolicited picture, that you do not want a sexual image, can can you they be prosecuted for that, if you know who it is? They can, yeah. If someone sends you a picture, there's, at the moment, there's two things you can do. You can go to the platform and ask them to tackle it. So the likes of Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, Twitter, all these sort of places and ask them to tackle it. You can go to the Gardaí and ask them to investigate it, and they can investigate it under criminal law, and it is an offence. It carries up to two years in prison. And what this commission will eventually do is have a third place you can go, which is an individual complaints mechanism. You go straight to the commission and say, I'm not happy with how the social media company has dealt with my complaint, and then the commission will pick that up on your end and go and say, look, why aren't you dealing with this? Uh, I mean, mean, it's frightening that it's taking so long for this to come in, but it's good. How will they go after the companies on this? So that's the big thing. I remember Catherine Martin is the the minister that's leading out on this. And I remember a a few months ago, she had a press release and she said that the commission was being given real teeth to deal with these social media companies in the form of fines. So the fine will be up to 20, it can be 20 million will be the lowest or 10%. The lowest, wow. Or 10% of the company's turnover, which obviously for the likes of Facebook and Google is enormous money. And if they still don't tackle that, and it goes on. You can also take criminal action against the management in the company, so they could be make criminal offences and, and be prosecuted under that. So that's the sort of teeth they'll give. Now, whether that's going to be this commission will be all bite and no bark, or all bark and no bite. Yeah. I mean, will they simply threaten these fines and will they go through with them? And how does the social media companies react? Will they take legal action to challenge these fines? So it's it's going to be very interesting to see how this washes out. We've started to see fines, you know, being perpetrated on social media companies. Mm that are, you know, seen biggest fines ever this mm. year on them. But, Nicola, when it comes to this, already it's a criminal offence with up to two years. I mean, but it's everywhere, right? It is absolutely ubiquitous. So it's not a deterrent? 
It doesn't seem to be, no. Um, it's, you know, it's anywhere you're a woman online, you are at risk of getting sent unsolicited graphic images or messages or videos. And it's so ubiquitous. It's not even in places like just online dating where you might kind of expect to find it to a degree. It's on LinkedIn. It's on Amazon Marketplace. It's you know, you're shopping for shelves and someone's sending you this back in return. It is ubiquitous. So it doesn't seem, I don't think people realize that it's illegal. And I think maybe the conversation that we're having around this now is really important to make, make sure people realize it's illegal um, and to help perhaps stop it. I, I was even just hearing about this this morning. I couldn't believe it. Like on a plane, you get an airdrop and it just pop. And that, you think about the kids and teenagers that have phones and yeah. this. Like, it is quite... Fr why, why do people do this behind a hidden platform? Well, they're not always even hidden. Um, okay. So they, they do do it through airdrop where they are hidden, um, but they will do it when they are also not hidden and not anonymous. So it's not just anonymous accounts doing this. It's actual regular people who do this on the regular basis. And the reason they do it is fascinating. So it's not transgressive to a lot of men who are doing it. They're doing it because they think women will like it. It is a partner <laughs> hunting strategy, a mating strategy. So they think that so if they got messages, they would be quite excited. So they think that women must think the same way. So they send them because it excites them, because they're proud of it, they feel good about sending it, they think that women will be excited, will send images in return or will hook up with them. That is the vast majority of men. Now, there is a minority of men, so about 10% do it for power and control, yeah. which is like offline flashing, where it's not really about sex. No. It's about manipulating another person's emotions, making them feel disgusted, degraded, shocked. Yeah. And then there's about 6% who are doing it for very misogynistic reasons. They hate women and they get pleasure out of sending these mess messages or images yeah. because they know it'll cause a reaction. I'd, I'd like to say as well that w women do send these as well. Like it is, there is definitely women. It's, this is not yes. exclusionary, both both sides of the coin on yeah. this one where people do not yet, you know what I mean? Where you don't want to be getting stuff that people are being sent to you. Do you want to talk more on that? No. no. <laughs> uh, so, but it, how, if this is happening, first of all, can I ask you, this is not a good mating strategy, right? It's not, no. Thank you. Okay, I just want to yeah. clarify no, so that for the, everyone. The research shows, <laughs> anecdotal evidence and the research show that women are disgusted by it. They do not enjoy it. They do not find it exciting. No. It's not a good mating strategy. It doesn't work. Women, are, in particular, you're going about your day and this arrives, you know, with no context, no warning. You don't know the person. It's disturbing. Women are shocked. Yeah. And it's happening to young girls. 11, 12 years old, sometimes their older siblings are managing their social media accounts for them to try and, you know, delete these before they see them because they remember how shocking and confusing yes, it was yeah. for them. Um, so that's really disturbing. And that's particularly places like Snapchat where grown men are sending images so, to young girls. So parents, should parents, as soon as they hand over a phone to their children, be having this chat with them? And, before, and what do you even talk to your kids about for yeah, this? Before you ever let your kid near, you should be doing this early, like way before you oh think God. they will ever need it. You should be having a conversation about the kinds of things you might see online because it, it also, you know, people come across pornography accidentally sometimes. Yeah. So, you know, what do you do when you come across something like this or something that shocks you or confuses you? How do you deal with it? What are your strategies? Come and talk yeah. to us about it. Those kinds of things. Adam, real quickly on this, because if these fines are so big, we know that these companies are multi-billion euro companies mm -hmm. and that they're under, they're not putting as much money as they could into their prevention measures, which they could be doing. They have algorithms to find these things online. If a female nipple goes up on some platforms, it can be spotted within 15 seconds and taken down. They have the technology. Uh, do we know if the if this will be a deterrent for them to go, right, rather than being fined 20 million, should I spend that 20 million on some people to stop this happening before it can get into an 11 year old's account? Yes, so I think the government are kind of basing a lot of this legislation on the idea of an online safety commissioner on the Australian model. And Australia yeah. initially brought this in, and there was a bit of backlash from the likes of Meta and Facebook and the, the, the bigger social media companies. They said they There's, were going to turn off their, 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 their turn off in Australia. Yeah, and they said they were going too far, and there was already police mm. laws there to deal with this, and why did they need extra laws and things like this? But the government now are saying that when you look at what's happened in Australia, they have come into tow, they've started to, you know, 
do what the laws are saying and, and comply to these online safety codes. So I think that's what the government want to see happen now. They kind of you want to use these threats as something that will and push the companies to, to take action. It's a real positive thing. I'd love to hear from people at home on this. 0896 yeah. 111 Is this something that you have to deal with with your own children? Is this something you have to deal with popping up on your own phone? We'd love to hear from you as well because it is great news that this is coming into law yeah. as well. Listen, Adam Higgins, political correspondent with the Irish Sun and cyber psychologist uh, Nicola Fox Hamilton, doctor. Thank you so much. <laughs> so now, much. Alan, what's coming up next? Well, Tommy, from mortgage lending changes to rude restaurant customers, I wonder who that could be. We've got all the top stories next. Now, some good news for house hunters as the central bank looks set to ease mortgage lending rules. Is that music to your ears this morning? News Talks' Andrea Gilligan is here with more. Good morning. Good morning. It's lovely to good have morning. you here. Good morning. So, you? this has been announced. The central bank are obviously in charge since 20 to ease because because of what happened during the Celtic Tiger they're like lads you're not allowed to borrow more than three and a half times yeah, your salary yeah they brought it in 2015 um, following on from the financial crash and they said you can have three and a half times your salary which meant if you're a single person on 50,000 you could buy at 175 what they've now they've now looked at this they've had a review of it um, they promised to do this review and the reason they're doing the review for multiple different reasons you've got those in the housing sector will say that the current rules are far too restrictive mm -hmm. we're also at odds with, with other EU countries even, even with our neighbours in, in the UK as well and for people that are actually when you're in the space of looking at houses that extra 25, 30,000 is game changing yes. it's, it's the difference between maybe you know a one bed or a two bed or an apartment or a house mm. you know suburban or, or rural or suburban area so, so there was a lot of pressure um, on, I think for this to happen there's been a lot of calls for it to happen and the governor of the central bank said right we'll take a look at it that review is due to be published this morning and what we're expecting what's going to be announced is that they're going to say that three and a half uh, three and a half times limit mm -hmm. is now going to be moved to four times your salary which means that somebody if you get a joint couple who are on you know 100,000 euros that would really make a yeah, difference that of, could be a, a total game changer of, for them instead yeah. of being able to have 350,000 euro mortgage you can now have a mortgage of 400,000. Now, yes, you're going to have more money to be able to go out and buy your house. Yeah. You're also now going to have more money to repay. Because mm -hmm. it's funny when you say it's, it's, good, it's good news for homeowners. It is good news for homeowners when you're in the space of looking to yeah. buy. Mm -hmm. But you now have more money to repay at a time when the cost Interest of borrowing rates, yeah. is higher. I mean, the one thing that strikes me is somebody who is, is, has been in this space very, very recently um, of looking at houses is that, you know, like... <laughs> You're, you're giving people more money and they're now going to have to pay more money back at yeah. a time when it's going to cost them more. a lot more to pay it back. Yeah. Um, but look, I mean, the, the, the one big issue that we haven't solved in all of this, and I don't think anyone thinks this is a solution to it, is that whether I have 175000 today to buy my house and I have 200000 in January, yeah. the reality is that there's no more supply out there. But so the now, concern... Now, hold on. There is an... Because I'm like a hawk obviously watching houses all the time and the amount of houses that are coming online is way more because whatever you want to call them vulture funds they they need equity china has crashed there is more there are more houses on the market there's a lot of you see all these articles. Well, going. landlords are selling out as well. Is, is well completely true, hard. Landlords well. are, they are selling out. And that's so, why the eviction ban till next April yeah, has been, to has help been, that. Has been brought yeah. in. Yeah. But, I mean, the, the one concern I will say about this, and I think this is where there's going to be a lot of discussion and there's going to be a lot of interest on this press conference from the Central Bank later this morning, is effectively you're giving people somewhere in the region of around twenty five to 50000 more money to play with. Effectively, it's bidding money. Yeah. And that's, 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 the, that's the big mm. concern yeah. is that, you know, for, for people who were maybe, so when you just drive? lose out on that house, you might have had the mortgage for it, but you lost out because there was, there was a bidding war. It just means that you now have so more do, money Do you to actually bid. think now the house, the house prices are going to rise well, concern, because of this? The concern because is... Because you're yes. saying that, oh, we've that, we've that extra few bob, yeah, now we can go the, there, the we can go there. The concern is there's going to be upward pressure now on house prices. But the one thing that we have seen in, from recent reports is that there is some element of a stabilisation of house prices in part parts of the country. I suppose the hope here, and look, we, we have to listen to the central bank. I mean, they're the experts. I'm not in this area. But what they're saying is it's the combination of, yes, if we give people that little bit more money from three and a half to four times their yeah. salary, yes, the cost of borrowing is higher. But with inflation and with a levelling off of house prices, mm. they feel that this actually won't increase the upward, uh, the upward price. And also, of we should property. remember that an awful lot of this plays into investment funds who are buying full yeah. estates. Oh, it's going to go up, it's going to go up. You know, there's a lot of what's, 
what's going on with buy to let in relation to this market and feeding into a narrative w with them. Sorry, I know. Yeah. I, no, the, I the, the one thing I do just want to say, and I, I think the one thing that a lot of people were looking at today when you're in the space of looking at houses is that the loan to value cap isn't going to change. So you are still going to be required to have that 10% deposit. And I know when I cast my mind back to that time, actually what would nearly would have had been more beneficial to people when you're in the space of buying a house mm. is... Actually, if you didn't need the ten percent deposit, it would have made a massive, yeah, massive difference. Trying look, to I, save yeah. that, absolutely, trying to put that you were together, still going yeah. to be required. We're hearing today to we, have that ten percent deposit for a first-time buyer. We but. just want to move on to parents' urge to cut back on children's and healthy snacks and. One in five children in Ireland are overweight or obese. Mm. Yeah, it turns out a fifth of them uh, from the ages of two to four, a fifth of their calorie intake is down to biscuits, chocolate, sugary, uh, sugary treats, high saturated foods. This is according to this report that's out from Safe Food Today. What's interesting is that that actually rises to 25% for children of primary school going age. But I think what's really interesting is when you combine those figures today with other research that's out in the Irish Independent, it looks at the parental approach or attitude. Yeah. Um, how, how parents parent their kids effectively mm. determines the... Um, has, has an impact on, yeah, on their weight. On eating so, for instance, their, yeah. if, you, if you are a very authoritarian parent, high discipline, high rules, and maybe less warmth in your approach, mm. or a neglectful parent, you're actually consider, you've a considerably higher chance of having children, um, your kids are going to be obese through their early, uh, early primary school years and into adolescence, according to the research that's, that's isn't out it, today. Isn't it amazing? Because we, we all know about obesity now. It's not like we don't know about it. And we every, every time we hear all the parents, we know about healthy snacks, maybe give them an apple instead mm. of a, a biscuit and stuff like that. So it's extraordinary yeah. to see these figures. It's, 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 the, it's the parenting style or the parenting approach. Um, That's I think, brand new. No yeah, one, you didn't and, know. And this was research that was carried out. That They looked at about 10,000 different kids through research from a university, um, the University of Melbourne, and through an obesity study that they were conducting there. And this is what they'd found, that that authoritarian style... Um, is is less productive. Mm. You're better to have, well, I suppose, more warmth in the approach, and feels, particularly yeah. in the around It feels food. weird that you're like, if your child is a little bit overweight, they're like, oh, they're not a very warm parent, isn't it? <laughs> That's what people are looking at them now. It's a little bit mad. Um, from News Talk, Andrea Gilligan, thank you so thank you. much thank for you joining us Thank you so much for today. joining Cheers. us this morning. Now, lots more still to come after the break. Stay with us. We'll see you in a few minutes. Hello, welcome back to Wednesday's show. He's worked with everyone from Daniel Day-Lewis to Judy Dench. Not bad, is it? It's like Alan Hughes. <laughs> uh, actor Stanley Townsend on Catching the Acting Bug in college, his Ballycus Angel days, and working on Star Wars. You'll get that Alan Hughes photo today, though. It's going to be great. That's what he's going to right put up Right up there with Daniel Day-Lewis on it. the fridge. Now from Fancy Footwork, two fictions, Strictly's Anton Dubeck on The Real Life Dancers, who inspired his best-selling novels. Plus, we're going to help you heat your home for less with some DIY tips and tricks. Alan, how are you doing? Are you getting ready to get your photo taken with Stanley Townsend? I did work with Daniel Day-Lewis. Did you, yeah? I knew yes. it. Yes, in the name of the Father and I'm on my left foot. I thought you were about to say in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> <laughs> so shy. Uh, now, uh, Captain Layton is whipping up some <laughs> zesty treats for us this morning. Yes, what we're have making you got for us, a lovely Catherine? lemon tray bake. So it's a large, large tray bake, ideal for all the family and for school lunches and whatever else. And really simple to make. Oh, it looks, look. they look delicious. Yep. Are they really moist? Very moist. Oh, yeah, yes. love that. Looking yes. forward to that a little later on. Now, Derek is in Westmead this morning. Derek, it was lashing earlier on. Is it still pouring there? It is still pouring. We're here in Delvin. I think I had a bit of a slip up in terms of the pronunciation earlier on. Delvin here in County Westmead. In fact, they have a lovely book festival on the 30th of October here in the village. Anyway, torrential rain out there this morning. That status orange rainfall warning in place for those five counties until midnight tonight. But we're here in Delvin in County Westmead, uh, guys, because we're heading out the road to meet the Bray family, including Finch and Bray, who has become the first person in the country with Down syndrome to be elected to a senior position within a political party. So we're going to be heading out the road to the Bray family. I hope they've got uh, some nice, uh, a nice big pot of tea <laughs> ready for us because this is lashing here in the village this morning. Uh, for some yeah. days I Send wish I'm out of the studio and today is definitely not <laughs> one of them. Did you see that when the camera didn't like that at all when the truck went past? I'm sure no. it's going to get drenched. <laughs> uh, there are umbrellas, Derek. You did have one earlier. <laughs> Maybe pull it out. But uh, honestly, it is dangerous out there if you are going somewhere. In the car, take your time. Uh, take your time.
Now, following on from those mortgages, Alan, a lot of people get in touch. Yeah, but Mwirin, you have some very interesting facts there about what you sh the, the type of salary you have to be on. Yeah, now this uh, The is average salary you have to be on to buy a house these across days. Across the state, and it's different, obviously, for single people and people who are in a couple, but across the state, the CSO found that you have to have an income of 71,300 in order to be able to buy a house in Ireland. That's what do you mean to buy a house? Any That's house? Any house. That's the average across... The state. So you've nurses, you have nurses, teachers are starting out, and like they wouldn't be on seventy-one thousand. So if you're a single, so if, if you're a single person, yeah, yeah. you're forget about forget it. Forget about it. You can't. There's certain places that you just will not be able to live. In and order to and so yourself. mainly part of all of Dublin, nearly. Well, Dublin, so, Galway, Cork. Yeah. No. First time buyers, they need ten percent. Everybody else needs twenty yeah. percent. So because my husband bought his house before we met, he we now need a twenty percent deposit for any second home we would like to buy. We have we both have good incomes, a budget to buy three hundred and fifty k, but we're stuck on our starter house because it's taken forever to try and raise up the deposit of that seventy thousand. Seventy grand. The the requirement for twenty percent deposit is ridiculous, and if you're not buying for investment, but rather just to size up, yeah, how difficult to that to say, particularly in these days as well. Yeah, yeah see, the, the issue cost is of everything. If, if she decides to go, okay, well, I'm buying my first time house, you know, and goes, I want to get the 10% deposit, but then they take her into income and you can't you do can't that. You can't do that, know, yeah. To get with the house. Uh, Fiona said, uh, all the mortgage changes will do is drive up house prices. If people can borrow more, prices will go up. And we were saying it's this. The interest rates that it's kind of going to take. Yeah, in as well. but Andrea did sort of say if you've more, if you've more money to play with, Absolutely. the bidding process maybe becomes a bit more that you can sort of say, oh well, we can afford to outbid now. We can afford to push the price up a bit more. They've Definitely. Fourteen percent in less than two years yeah. already. What well, house, house prices? Mm. I know, but 40%. stuff like this could, could drive it up again. But they're starting to drop. They're starting to drop. So you the think country. that they shouldn't make it a bit easier? They should make it a bit easier. It's, it's, I, I think that we're in for a rude awakening with what's about to happen because equity firms, places who own houses in Ireland, people who don't live here, who aren't private individuals, they're selling up in Ireland. Sorry. Okay. Heard they it are. here first. Uh, heard it here they first. They need equity. Let's talk about the unsolicited images. Of course, this is new legislation that's been yeah, brought in to, to actually penalise not the people who are sending nude pictures, uh, which are unsolicited. They're actually going to go after the companies to try and really stamp this out. Uh, social media platforms do absolutely nothing to tackle this problem. They say that if it's in a DM, it's your own problem and to not look at it. The guards are also very unhelpful, helpful as they will make a report and then tell you that they have no way of t obtaining the IP address of the person who sent the image. I mean, it's quite frightening that if you're just getting this dropped into your inbox, not expecting it, and the guards are saying they can't do anything about it. Yeah, but this is the that, point. They will no longer be able to say it's your problem. If well, it hopefully, your, yeah. yeah. Hopefully, yeah. if this media commission works. Yeah, because I think it's absolutely the right thing to do. Yeah. If these are being just sent... I mean, I couldn't believe it. Somebody said that if you're on an, an, an airplane and you're packed beside each other mm -hmm. and people are just airdropping, Pictures and you just you get this you open it up. You don't know what it yeah, is. Know what and it is. suddenly there's, there's I mean, a new. Of course, new you there. probably shouldn't open it. But I mean, it is decline, yeah. decline, decline, yeah. decline. <laughs> but it's starting to work in Australia. So surely, hopefully, we can follow Thank their model. Yeah. Uh, now, after the break, we've got something uh, completely different. Dublin actor Stanley Townsend. He'll be here. I want to talk about Valley Kiss Angel, but a lot I of want people... to talk Star Trek, Star, Star Wars. Wars, Star Wars, Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> he probably is in Star <laughs> Trek too. He's been <laughs> in everything. He's been in everything. <laughs> he totally knows about Star Wars and Star Trek. We'll be back with you in just a minute. Mad for it. Now, our next guest has worked with acting icons such as Colin Farrell, Daniel Day Lewis, Judy Day. I mean, is there anyone? This man You're just obsessed with his with. IMDb going, look at this, look at this. <laughs> Amazing. From his Amdram days at Trinity College to a galaxy far, far away, we're joined this morning by Stanley Townsend. Good morning, Stanley. Good it's morning, lovely guys. to have you here. Yeah, it's brilliant to be we here. We have to go through, like, the like uh, you know, I watched you every Sunday night in Batty K, of course. We'll get to that in a second. But, like, working with people like Judy Dench, who just, every time you know she's going to be on Graham Norton, you're like, oh, my God, this is a treat. Is she as much of a treat of a human? Oh, she's brilliant. The dude, Dench. We used to call her the dude. The dude. Yeah. Dudes. yeah, she's great. She loves uh, crosswords. Myself and McLean. We were doing the play on the stars. Sam Mendes directed it, and uh, she was playing Bessie Burgess. She was brilliant, but she loved crosswords. So myself and McLean decided we'd take her on on the Telegraph crossword, and we tried to beat her. We never did, of course. But uh, yeah, she was a beautiful woman to yeah. work with. And did you have a good relationship with her that you would, you know, was there a group of you all came together oh, and yeah, challenging each other crack, crosswords? It was crack. 
She carried this big bunch of keys, and I'm looking at her and going, why all the keys, Judy? And she says, that's if they try and mug me. This is a <laughs> legal weapon. Really? Ooh. Judy Dench does what I do, <laughs> holding a big bunch of keys, does she? so much in common. I know, me and Judy, <laughs> we're the exact same. We're the exact same person. Um, you, I think, you know, when you mention like loads of things and it's always like, worked with Daniel Day-Lewis, you know, In the Name of the Father, one of the most iconic movies from Ireland. Your, you were the, um, your title was <laughs> Hooker's Driver. Yeah. That's wow. Yeah, yeah. Well done. When yeah. you got that part, <laughs> yeah, Stanley. Yeah, I tell you. My line was, she's out of your league, Paddy. <laughs> That was my line. <laughs> <laughs> and you deliver it. So, yeah. you still, I'll never forget him. You still got it. <laughs> so, did they obviously spotted this prowess from Ballycus Angel then? <laughs> yeah, I played Tonto. I can't remember his second name. Tonto. We couldn't work out why he was called Tonto, and I decided maybe he calls everyone Kima Sabi. So, oh. that's what I did. I called everyone Kima Sabi, yeah. I had to beat up Colin Farrell. Yeah, he was just starting out on the rise. He's done very well. <laughs> he has done. Learned everything we were beating he beating him up. <laughs> That's what it was. Was Barry Kay, like being on the set, it was just like a warm hug on a Sunday night sort of yeah, thing. Was yeah. it lovely? It was beautiful. And we had really good weather. I was on it for about five or six episodes down in Avoca with all those people on the beach. And it was gorgeous. It was a dream come true. Yeah. Really lovely. Uh, and you st when we were reading the notes with this, so you're obviously been in all these amazing movies, you've been involved with so many amazing actors, but when I read that you studied maths and civil engineering in Trinity, it didn't quite add up. How did you go from that into acting, where you are now? Well, I suppose I was good at maths, so, and I wanted to be an architect, but didn't get enough points, so I ended up in Trinity doing engineering and... I got involved in the Amateur Dramatic Society in Trinity, and that was kind of my first year. I got it really good marks in because I didn't go to the Amateur Dramatic Society. Mm, then okay. second, third, and fourth, I didn't do so well in the engineering. It kind of follows but, your passion almost. Yeah, first. yeah, absolutely. I thought maybe you know I might be quite a good actor, but a mediocre engineer. So I gave acting a go, and here I am. And you kind of bartered your way into it as well. That's right. Yeah, myself and Johnny Spears. We set up a set construction company because I always used to build the sets. So when we left. College, we did this, and to, you had to get an equity card back in those days. So you had to get the offer of a job, an equity contract. So I did a really good deal on the set for King Lear and got the contract to play Cornwall <laughs> at the same time. So that's how I got started. That's wow. how I got Like, I'll build your set, yeah, yeah. you give me a part. Correct. Love it. I mean, even <laughs> whenever I went to college, I had rugby on the side, and yeah. rugby was going great, but my mum was always like, make sure you keep studying. <laughs> So whenever you went off and did the acting route, I mean, did you were your parents right? Were they kind of going, oh, we should maybe stick to the engineering? My father looked at me and he just dropped his head and shook it. <laughs> <laughs> really? All those years working to put him through college and now he's going to be an actor. <laughs> And but, he was... you know, we had a good time. He loved watching the shows. He used to say, I think you're best when you do comedy. Oh, right. We <laughs> love, have, love and, the honesty. Yeah, and then when yeah. you got the hooker's driver part, he was like, he's I'd made say, it. Yeah, we've made it. He's made it. That's, <laughs> that's what it is. You're going around the country right now. You're touring in, in a play, and this is a, a heavy-hitting play, Solar Bones. Tell us about it. Yeah, it's uh, based on... Uh, it's a single-sentence novel written by Mike McCormick. It's a wonderful thing. It's, it's a stream of consciousness that's been adapted for the stage uh, by Michael West, and I play uh, Marcus Conway, who's a civil engineer. OK. So it's finally, coming it's coming in. in. <laughs> work for you. Yeah, yeah. And so it's a scientist's vision of, of his life, and he's trying to work out what's going on. Has he... He's in his kitchen, or is he in his kitchen? Has he been in a car crash? Is he institutionalised? Has he got dementia? So it's a kind of detective story as he goes through his life trying to work out what the hell is going on? Where the hell am I? What is this day that I'm in? And then as you go through, you finally work out what the hell is happening to him. Mm -hmm. So you'll have to come along to find out. Sounds amazing. It's, uh, but it's a one, like it's a one-man play. That's correct. I am the entire cast. <laughs> this is it. What is that like? It's a bit lonely at yeah. times. Yeah. It's it's a great privilege to be at the center on the main stage in the Abbey. So um yeah, there's a great team of people working, you know, but when you step out first, step onto the stage, you know, well, this is it for the next hour 40. I'm it. So, yeah. 140,000 words. 
Well, no, 40, no. 40, 40, 40, sorry, 000, sorry. 14,000. 14,000, 14, sorry, 14, that's what I'm missing. 14,000 words. words. Yeah. But I'm just saying, there's no, for an hour, and you don't have, you know, um, obviously a memory palace, but you don't have something going, and now you go to this. And now, do you have things no, set up to no, be like, remember no, to do no. this? Do you, remember it, you remember God. it like a song line, you know, you remember it like a journey. So you walk through, when you get to this point, you oh do that, gosh. and you get this, this story now, and this is this beat now. And there's an emotional journey through it. And also there's the detective story of him trying to piece together what exactly is happening. Wow. So yeah, it all kind of comes in a flow and you have time, you yeah, know, yeah, you yeah. have time. You can stop and think and go, right, what is the next bit I have to do? <laughs> okay, no, that's sound well, on we go. So I love know, the crowd are sitting there going, why has he just stopped? <laughs> what was it like doing a one-man show in COVID time, though? Because you did this back. Yeah, we did it in Kilkenny um, two and a half years ago. At the height, we were lucky in that we could do it, so it yeah, felt like a great okay. privilege to do it. But we were in a theatre, a 350, 400-seater, and only allowed 50 people in, and that included the cast and the crew and the ushers. So we had about 39 people in, all wearing masks and taped between them. So I looked out at an audience that had masks on and it was surreal. It's not the yeah. same, yeah, yeah. It's without that. It's called Solar Bones. It's you've been in Castle Bar, so you did Mayo yeah. already, which is absolutely gorgeous. Uh, Abby uh, in Dublin, fantastic. You're going to be in Cork as well. It's touring 15th of October. Already started through until the 4th of November. So you're going around Ireland, but you you're at home for a while. That's right. Doing that. Uh, normally you're over in London, living That's away right. doing your thing. Where you got to film, you're now part of the, like the mega. Star Wars universe. You have yeah. set your pension plan for the rest yeah. of your yeah. life, if you want, yeah. with made the comic it. cons. Finally made it. What's Andor is getting rave reviews. Yeah, it's really good. It was like the make or break one for yeah, Disney, yeah. really. Yeah, yeah. So, Harry, like, what was it like on that set? It was amazing. It's the scale of the thing, really. I mean, our episode, the episode I'm in, there's a massive heist, a bullion heist, and they built the freighter and they built the bullion vault and I'm supposed to open up the vault. And so I'm at a screen and that all works. It's kind of black and white with one red color in it and retro, but it all functions. So anything you interact with, they've built and made and it works. And um, there was a massive shootout and they rehearsed that and filmed it with all the stuntmen and they wore vests to identify which character they were. And then they show you that. Wow. wow. And then they break it down into 30 second sections and you go and you shoot it then. It's the budget just in different level, you know, because you're, you're involved in a Netflix show as well, Chaos too. That's right, but like, yeah. you know, because they're not going to the cinema. These are going onto stream devices, yeah. but it sounds like when you get involved in this, it's a whole different world. Yeah. The scale of the thing is, is massive. I mean, you're still working with the people, yeah. the wonderful circus folk of making film and television, but... Um, now, the scale of the thing is is a completely different... I remember when we were doing Star Wars and I put on the gear for the first time because I'm working for the man, I'm working for the Empire, you know? <laughs> and I'm in the Peter Cushing gear and I'm looking myself in the mirror and thinking, this is nuts. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's, it's nuts. nuts. <laughs> so uh, bonkers. Well right. done, you know, moving. Yeah. It's, it's a long Love way it. from driving people around London saying, you're not one of the only. Like Paddy. How are you only? <laughs> Paddy. Um, so the play is called Solar Bones. It's running until the 4th of November. Um, and you can find out more online, of course. I, I hope you enjoy being on the Abbey stage. Oh, I'm 14,000 words. Stanley Townsend, a pleasure meeting you. Oh, Thank you, you too, so much. Guys. Thank so nice. you, Stanley. <laughs> Now we've got the perfect sweet treat for you in the kitchen. And that's not just Catherine Layden, no. is it? Good morning, <laughs> Catherine Layden. Good morning, Good morning. Lemon tray bake. A lemon tray bake, really simple recipe. Now I have a tip for you. If like today or like last night, the weather was quite cold and your marge or your butter is hard, mm -hmm. to make it easier to blend or to beat, you fill your mixing bowl with some boiling water. That's nice okay. and warm so it's there nice now. nice and warm. Mm. And then into that, we're going to put our butter. But another tip to make it blend a lot better and quicker, cut it into eight one ounce or 25 gram pieces. So you're breaking the grain in the butter by doing this. Mm -hmm. So okay. it'll blend a lot better and quicker for you, okay? Very good. Now, handy. if you don't have a freestanding mixer... That's a whole you... half a pound of butter has yes. gone into that. That's where the flavour comes from, Al, you see. <laughs> Correct. I've already had two, they're delicious. Yeah, you've already had two, yeah. Now, see the way it's starting to melt already? Okay, yeah. yeah. Hot bowl. 225 grams, that's eight ounces, of our caster sugar. 
and you just beat those ingredients together. Now, if the butter is at room temperature, the bowl is hot, it will come together really quickly for you. So there we have it. Now, just lower the heat, lower the heat, as I lower the beaters, the speed of the beaters, and add one egg at a time. So we're putting in three eggs into this. And why do you add one egg at a time? It just blends quickly. Oh, yeah, mixture. okay. And worth mentioning here as well, it helps if your eggs are at room temperature, like your butter and your sugar. Oh, that really? means your mixture won't curdle okay. exactly. It yeah. won't curdle. Yeah. Okay, right. Now, to that, we're going to add the. What would you do without that blender? It's so handy, isn't oh, it? And they're very handy. Yeah. 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 Well, now, in the old days, they didn't have one in your That's made. correct. Oh, By no. the wooden elbow grease and the elbow wooden spoon. Elbow grease, yeah. yeah. 250 grams of our self raising flour. And to that, we're going to add a level teaspoonful of um, baking powder. Uh, could now, you use normal flour? I know. Has to be self raising. You'd have to, you know, well, you'd have to use a, tape, a teaspoonful if you're using the regular plain flour. Okay, great. Okay. Level teaspoonful of baking powder. And while that's blending away there now, I'm going to add one fairly full dessert spoonful of lemon curd. Jam. Now, we were talking about this just before we came on air, about how lemony should it go. Well, I don't like it too lemony, mm. to be honest. And I think most people don't. Yeah. So now, to this. So just the one lemon, you use the rind in the icing and the juice. The rind in the mixture and the juice in the icing. Where do, where do you get lemon curd? Uh, you can buy it in shops. Buy it, you can also make it. So do you just buy a jar of that? Well, if yeah. unless you want to make it. So a jar of that Pot and what jam, was that? Yeah. A, a scoop? Or make your own, which is gorgeous. Lot okay. of egg yolks. So if you make a baked Alaska, for example. How do you make your own, Catherine? Egg yolks, butter and sugar. Delicious. And all plenty of lemon. And lemon, okay. I was going to say. Yeah. Just lemon, lemon juice in it. Lemon juice, yeah. Squeezed into Squeeze it. Squeeze into it, yeah. Now, here I'm finally adding my 150 mils or a quarter pint of milk. And you have quite a thick, quite a thick batter like mixture. So we just give it one last blast. Oh! <laughs> one last blast is right. Hello. Oh, blast it is right. Blast uh, is right. The, so the lemon rind is in there as well. I don't know if people yes, so how much, how much, that in. How much, so you have one teaspoonful of the lemon curd and then how much of a rind? Oh, no, I have a tablespoonful of lemon curd. A tablespoonful. Yeah. And, and then with the rind, how much, how many lemons? The rind lemons? of one lemon. One, just one lemon. lemon is all oh, you okay. need, yeah. One lemon. Let's now, have a look at that. Oh, I guess it is for like a batter. A batter, right. Very nice. God, yeah. Simple, simple. Now, it'll take slightly longer, of course, if you're using the hand mixer, you know, a three-speed hand mixer. So when do you put the squeeze the lemon? Do, do you not? The rind went into this with the lemon curd. Come in. Oh, yeah, but the lemon curd, but you're not actually and the cut lemon open rind. a lemon and lemon no. Yeah, you do, you put the, it into... You put the squeeze, the juice of the lemon the top of the, into a jug. The okay, right. Now watch this. Just spread it evenly in the tin. And that's a fairly big tin, Catherine. Yeah, like a 12 by 7, we roughly recommend. Right. OK? And that is about um, the size of a small roasting tin. Right. OK? Now, we're going to take out the one we put in the oven about 40 minutes ago. God, I'll have another one. Oh, yeah, it. you'll have another one, will you? OK, there we go. You have that, I'll have this. Right. Give it a little taste. Mm. Let's have a now, oh. look at this. One you made earlier. Look at that, gorgeous. We Golden should have waited brown. for the hot one. Now, you know it's baked when you gently touch it and it springs back to you. All right. OK. okay. Now, while it's hot, this is important, as soon as you take it out of the oven, prick it well with the fork mm. or a skewer. And while it's baking, I put into my jug here, I put the juice of one lemon and... Six ounces, 270, 175 grams of um, icing sugar. OK. Yeah, now, the icing is gorgeous on top of it. You spread that on while it's hot so that it almost disappears, as you see there. And it sinks into sinks it. Sinks into it, exactly. And could you have made that the kind of the batter the night before and kept it in no, the fridge? No. no. OK, so it needs to be kind of done it the day. It needs to be done it. on the day, yeah. OK, right. Look at that, the Now, icing you can heat well. this in the microwave or on the hob. I just put this into the microwave. Just before we came on, so it's. Does it need to be that the, thick? No, it's to be a little bit thinner than this. Oh, weird. Really? And but so you nearly just, pour, you could pour it on, is it? You do pour it on, yeah. But because I had this done before we came on, so. It's a bit more lemon juice almost in it. Yeah. So now there we go. But this, it's not overly lemony no. though, is it? And that's no. kind of the, the lemon curd. And you just and leave that sit in the tin to go cold. And it goes hard on cut, top. Yeah. You see it? Yeah. You taste it there, yeah. Yeah. So there we have our 
I mean... Lemon drizzle drink. What is it? Why does the, le the, like, the bitterness almost work in it? Because it's a contrast, it's delicious, really. Delicious, though. Tommy, with the sugar and the lemon juice. And the butter. Mm. Half the butter. And the butter. Well, the butter <laughs> helps the sugar. as well. But also, the quarter pint of milk helps keep it moist. Oh, and yeah. this would keep in an airtight container for about three or four days if it lasts that long in the house. Yeah. It also freezes well. Oh, you put them in the you freezer? You freeze it, yep. OK. So now... OK, so you're better, I just want to see you finishing all that, Catherine. <laughs> oh. Yeah. I see you get it all it. done, scraping it all out. Mwern, we need to get Mwern over for, to try some here as well, Mwern, I think. Is Mwern going to try some? Yeah, Mwern, come on in, you grab one. Do you like a lemon, a lemon drizzle, Mwern? Here's Mwern? the plate. Hello. Here you go. Hello. Love a lemon mm. drizzle cake. Mm. Really yeah. tasty. Can I just grab one of these? You're back from your holidays. I didn't get you any tea. No tea for you. But well, you don't want mine. I don't want yours. No, Take I one of them there, yeah. Yours. Thanks, but Catherine. Lemon drizzle will be a dessert choice of yours. Anything to be a dessert right. choice of mine. Yeah. Yeah. Totally fine. <laughs> Catherine, is well, it one of the most popular things that people do? Yes, lemon it drizzle. Is. Yeah. yeah, just as, like because it's simple, like that, all into the Very one bowl. Very simple. Yeah, one stage at a time. But the tip is, as I've said, to heat your bowl and to cut your um, cut your butter into smaller yeah. pieces. Mm. Gorgeous, Catherine. Well, I have to say, it is delicious, isn't it delicious? <laughs> and were you happy last night now, Catherine, with Bake Off, that it's actually gone back to baking? It's not <laughs> cooking anymore. I loved it last night. I was, I was don't thinking, be I was giving gonna... it away. Don't I'm give it no, away. there's no spoilers. No. I'm just no spoilers, no. We're always giving out about the fact Who that... Who won? Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Nobody won yet. Stop it. No, it won yet. It's back to being a no. baking show. No. Catherine, 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 thank you so much. It's always lovely to see you. My pleasure. Now, lots more of Iron Day. I'm still to come. We'll see you in a few minutes because... <clears throat> Anton de Beck <laughs> will be here. And also, we'll have some home heating hacks. That says Tommy. You were meant to read that bit, Tommy, weren't you? I'm busy. He's, He's busy very eating. busy. We'll talk to you in a second. <laughs> Welcome back to Ireland AM, and this is the part of the show that's technically known as filling because technology has failed us. So would we like to do some filling today, guys? We were supposed to be down with Derek. He's doing a live, but we'll get we to him will. at some we'll stage. We'll get to him. We'll, we'll get, get to him. So we're going to have some texts now. Let's, uh, I saw yesterday all over oh. Twitter there was a story about James Corden. Oh, and yes, news, Carl right? was telling me about this last night. Well, did he tell? So what's happened? So he's gone to a restaurant. Baltazar's in LA. Is it with his wife? And well, don't. Oh, there really... was a homely. Seemingly, there's a group of them. All that said, they didn't point out who he was there with, just that James Corden was banned from Balthazar's because he is a tiny cretin of a man <laughs> and uh, and uh, that he wanted to bar him for how rude he is Had to the staff. staff. And they, yeah. he gave two examples. This is Keith McNally, who was the boss of the very famous restaurant Balthazar, New York, LA and London. Yes. Uh, so he banned him and then James Corden apologised to... To him. James Corden, the cuddly, lovely, smiley, friendly guy that never does anything wrong. But seemingly he had been very rude in a previous restaurant that this guy had been managing. So they've got as well. beef. So they've got beef. They've got okay. beef. Yeah. It's well, if you if you follow the thread on social media, there are many examples of how James Corden treats people. So it's in not this guy looking for publicity. No, no this uh, restaurant. Well, it's a bit of both. I think it? he's fairly rich. The rest, okay. Yeah, I okay. think he's pretty rich. Anyway, he called him personally and apologised, and he is no longer banned. Now James from Corden Balthazar. called him and yes. personally apologised. Yes, and he is no longer banned from Balthazar's restaurant. No, there so we go. It Aren't you all happy now about that? This but morning? it just it does it does make as someone it, like we've all worked those sort of jobs where you work in a restaurant, you work in a pub, you work in a shop, and people think because you're there behind a till or you're serving them something that they own you, and it doesn't matter. Like they're just so we've rude. talked about this you, recently. You have a real beef yeah. about this. Don't you? I just think people, and I think they're getting more and more rude the way they're treating mm -hmm. staff, th throwing things at them, doing absolutely nothing, staying on the phone when you're at a till. I've done it myself recently. I know that. It's I just realised I was like, what am I doing? Get off the phone. You're in front of a human being. But I just. Well, what about when the person behind the counter at the till oh, is yeah. on the phone? Yeah, it goes... and that has happened to me as well. And I was literally standing there. I was going. Excuse me, I'm standing here waiting to be served. You're lucky yeah. you didn't get barred from the place <laughs> out for the, the language person was on the with, phone. Yeah. That he was on the phone. I just think that there are lots of examples. I remember someone pulling a fast one in Australia on a friend of mine, and uh, we worked in an Italian restaurant. They got a really kind of expensive meal, and then we were like, "This fella, there's something dodgy here," and he like he took a a hair out of his wife's head and like put it on the meal after they'd eaten everything and said, oh. we're not paying for this. We were like, are you kidding? Like, we're watching you. We know what you're doing. But see, so did you tell them? What? Did you rat on them? 
did you tell the people? Did he try to claim for a free? Oh, he tried to get there? a free meal. Yeah. So did you tell them that? Nana, we saw him take. The owner was standing right there. We we're like, there's something wrong with this. Well, allegedly, dude. this was the kind of thing that happened in with James Corden. That what those, do you mean? The meal wasn't up to standard, and he demanded drinks. Oh, there was for a hair party, in it, wasn't there? In, in one time in previously. One, yeah. We'd love to hear from you. Whether you are a customer or indeed in the service industry. You know, just dish the dirt. Just tell us tell about us. those incredibly what, rude people. I love what those stories. I find 096 111 is really hard at the minute is how to know to tip. To uh, If you get a good waiter, how do you know that you're giving them the money? Because you don't have cash anymore. So they come up and they say, add tip, whatever. But I gather that doesn't go into the system that goes into tips for all the staff. Yeah, well, for a lot of a lot mm. of restaurants, yeah, that's the case. Now, do you know what the problem there is now? We're, we're going to get people who get, oh, yeah, I was there the night that we're in Tommy and Alan were out in town and they were yeah. abusive to us. <laughs> yeah. I think the less, uh, don't, okay, we'll, we'll uh, maybe get rid of those messages. <laughs> what yeah. night is that? Thanks very much. <laughs> I'm trying to think what, what night is that? That's mad. Uh, we would love to hear from you on that one. Uh, is that sufficient filling, everybody? It is. There Still to come, he's the public's favourite judge. We're going to be chatting to Strictly's Anton Dubek. We're also going to be helping your mind, uh, you mind your money with some DIY home heating hacks. Plus, it's all about date night on the catwalk. Oh, so you, you'd look you'd lovely going on a date. Very uh, Susie, I don't know. Susie. We'll see you in a few minutes. Welcome back to the final hour of Wednesday's Ireland AM. Now, he may never have won the glitter ball, an absolute travesty, but he certainly won our hearts. Strictly's Anton Dubeck tells us how he jived his way to the judges panel in just a little while. Alan, that's kind of in fashion. Well, we'll be jiving on the catwalk as well because it's all about the dinner date style. Justine, what have you got for us? Yeah, so I think dinner date means different things to different people. So we're showing some more casual looks like you'll see here on Sarah on the catwalk for maybe grabbing a bite to eat with the girls. But then we've got something a little bit dressier if you're going out for a fancy meal with your other half. So something Love that. Fresh. OK, looking forward to that. Tommy, you're going to save us a fortune. I never knew Anton de Beck never won the glitter ball. No, he never won Strictly. Wow, he's yeah. probably the most famous of the dancers yeah, as well. Never won it. There you go. Uh, now with the cold snap, well and truly here, DIY influencer Sean O'Connor is here. Good morning to you, Sean. Good morning. So my house is constantly leaking drafts all over the place. You've got some hacks on how to stop the flow. Yeah, absolutely. So I think this year we're all concerned about saving energy, reducing the energy bills and preserving heat. So I'm going to show you a few simple DIYs you can do to re reduce drafts in your Brilliant. home. Brilliant. So like chimney, letterbox, reflecting the heat radiators, really simple things people simple can things do. Simple things that anyone can do, yeah. Wow, looking forward to that. It's going to save people a fortune. Oh, you're very welcome back. It's great to have you with us there, Derek. Now we set we, we didn't have that yeah, chat. Unfortunately. Um, we were talking about uh, restaurants with James Corden and obviously bad customer service. He's or no, it. being a bad customer. But he is a bad, customer, a bad customer, but then we were talking about also yeah. on the other side, maybe on the flip side, sometimes when you go in somewhere and there's people on the mm. phones or whatever like that. But we'll I love this. Out there. My family had two restaurants and one night I was dining with friends in one of them. A man ate 90% of his meal <laughs> and then said it wasn't nice. <laughs> <laughs> expecting to get a refund. He was not the next table to me and didn't know we were family related. <laughs> he was sent on his way. Oh, really? <laughs> I love that now. Well so done. You can take that now and on your way. Oh, 90%. Yeah. 90%. Yeah, oh, suddenly I don't like it, that last 10%. He left a bit of the fat. Yeah, that was didn't in like on that the side bit. Of the oh, this one, when, I, when I worked in a famous fast food chain, we would get drinks and ice cream poured over us, especially through the window of the drive through Lads. Like that stuff. That's shocking, is, isn't it? Uh, That's they mad. just chuck it back at them. I was on a flight when I when I was flying home the other day. Um, the we were hitting a lot of turbulence, and the air steward had to say, "And please do not abuse the staff for this and not being able to go to the toilet. We do not control air turbulence because people have been shouting at them mm -hmm. about it being bumpy." Um, what well, are they meant to do about that? What are they supposed to do about it? I'm sure I know. Was it because they couldn't go to the loo while the sign there was, was a on? Bit of, but it, there was a bit of that, but it was also like, we can't control air turbulence. Like, there's there's rules. Here's but, another one. I'll read this one. I have worked in retail for years. The worst thing for me is when a woman reaches into a bra and takes some money out and hands it to me. What's wrong with that? I've also had a guy take the money out of his sock to pay. Oh, no. <laughs> But the bra sweaty. thing has come up a good bit. And I'm sorry, whatever about, about the bra sock. Oh, I know. <laughs> Take the money out of the sock. Well, the side of the sock. Pockets. I prefer the stock than the bra. I tell you, you, we've heard this story so many times, it's mad. 
Anyway, look, this Keith man will love this. Our Keith next guest will love this Because we've been looking forward to this all morning. <laughs> he's been part of the Strictly family since the show launched. Ooh, ooh, and ooh. now he's our favourite judge, Anton Dubeck, chats to us after the break. Well done for doing that. Mm, Great. So, so. Thanks for staying with us. Now our next guest has just won a national television award for best judge on a talent show. And he's only been in the seat for one series. That's right, Strictly Come Dancing. Anton Dubeck joins us now. Good morning, Anton. How are you doing? Good morning and thank you very much for having me on. I'm fine. It's, uh, it's lovely to chat to you this morning and thank you very much indeed. What's that we spot over your shoulder there? To be fair, we made you go get the award. <laughs> <laughs> I had to go upstairs into my bedroom and get it from my bedside table. It's been for you ever since I got It's it. The wife's, it your wife's it out is. of the bed. Oh, there it is. She's Congratulations. Gone. Congratulations, Anton. We have to ask, because for years, being one of the most popular dancers on Strictly, and having like never... the most popular as opposed to one of. The, sorry, the <laughs> most. How dare I? How dare I? Oh, she get out of there. But you never won the glitter ball, but you have won yeah. this. What? what does, does, do they compare? Well, the irony is that, I, you know, I spent about 400 years dancing and the first time I win an award is for sitting down. <laughs> so um, I'm not quite sure how I feel about that, but I'm delighted uh, to have won it. It's great. I mean, to have won the Glitter Ball, it would have been lovely, I suppose. Um, but this is this is a joy. Oh, look. There you are. Come here, what was, the, what was the talk from the other judges? Were they sort of going, lovely, true gritted teeth, or are they all so happy for you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it didn't speak me for a fortnight. Um, <laughs> no, they've been great. I mean, they've been really lovely. And I've known them all a long time, and so they all, they've been all, you know, they've been great, actually. They've been lovely. Everybody on the show has been wonderful. I mean, everybody in the, in the room, it was such a nice moment. I can't tell you. My wife was there with me. She's never come to an awards thing before. Um, and so that was the first time as well. And it, I mean, look at all the guys and girls there. And yeah. It was yeah. just, I have to say, it was one of the best nights I've ever had. Look, look at the big smile and you really meant it. Is there something to be said for the years, the, the decades we've had of kind of nasty judges always being the ones to stand out? And you've kind of come in in this world where, you know, there's a lot going on, there's a cost of living crisis and yeah. you're, you're just full of warmth and happiness and, and maybe that there's a bit of a sea change, that there could be positive things. Well, I don't want to have too many nice judges. That make me look bad. Um, I, I like, I, you know, having... The thing for me is that I've done it for a long time and I've been where all the couples are. I've stood there. And I know what it's like when it goes badly. Um, and it's, there's nothing you can do. And as a professional, you start dancing with your celebrity on the floor and there's, a, there's an element of hope. And, you know, and that's the worst thing, hope. It's the hope that dies. And it, <laughs> you can see how it's going immediately. And you can see your partner. You spend all this time with her. You know how it's going to go. And she, we start off, and it's going quite well, and then it goes a bit wrong. And you know in your heart, and you, you push through and you get to the end. But you know how it's gone. And if it's gone badly, you don't, I mean, lovely Ruth. I mean, that was epic. I mean, you know, you don't need the judges to have a go at you as well. There we go. Look, <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> uh, she gets. I mean, that was a surprise to both of us. She climbed on. But it was um, I mean, delightful, no, no, no less, but it was a surprise. Um, so you don't want the judge, I, I, you know, I never wanted the judges to go, that was awful when I knew it was awful. I just wanted them to go, oh, hard luck, but it wasn't your best go. Try to come out next week. And, you know, and I think I do that. I don't batter yeah, them when yeah. they're down. That's true. And, of course, we have to say that um, Strictly won Best Talent Show again. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, when you think of the, all the years battling up against X Factor and your shows like that, and you go, where's X Factor now? And Strictly well, still winning these awards. What is the enduring appeal of the show, do you think? Well, I think the show is so relevant, really, because it... It really does reflect what's going on in society in the show. And, you know, we've got everything going. We've got two boys dancing together, two girls dancing together. We got um, Rose last year, who was deaf, yeah, coming onto the nice. show and winning. Um, and Ellie's this year. And we've had um, Paralympians in, in the past on the show and doing quite well. So it's really sort of inclusive and, and all of that. I think that's a big part of it. But I think the enduring joy of the show is it hasn't changed. 
Mm. in all the time it, it's evolved but we haven't had these great changes in the show it's still fundamentally the uh the couples and we get a new cast every year the couples coming in dancing together being judged and then the audience at home coming in and voting for their for their personal favorites as well and then you get a new leaderboard every year but the, the uh, around that it's it's evolved so dramatically with all the techno technological changes technological changes yeah. couldn't say the word uh, oh, in television, the wonderful AR that we have, the augmented reality, we get these wonderful visions on screen that you see at home, mm. uh, the brilliant lighting, the incredible music, the costumes. There. So the whole thing is huge and brilliant and just every year just keeps getting better. And I'm, and I'm just so proud and thrilled to be a part of it. And it's wonderful because it's not tokenistic what I think you do with the cast on Strictly. It's very reflective of society and the people who are watching it, which is lovely. But we're all waiting every year mm. for when we're going to see the Anne Widdicombe moment. Like, that's what it is every year now. We're like, is that is that going to happen? Because, Anton, when you dance with Anne Widdicombe, like, yeah. it's, it's going <laughs> to, that's going to be shown for centuries if the planet survives. <laughs> I mean, it is, it is. I mean, I look at that. That was our second dance, the salsa. And we got to this part here and we hadn't, we, we weren't supposed to have got to it yet. We'd run out of choreography. And we, I, we'd missed a bit out. And so I just ripped her up in the air. I have to tell you, the place went mad when I picked her up. Like, <laughs> mad. And she was such a great, she was such a great, um, she was a, such a star. Do you know, and as well, she was the first person to be flown in. So all this stuff that you're seeing, the flying in, the smoke, the coming out of, I don't know, stuff. Yeah. Uh, and the first person to have done all that. I got, I got Anne to do all that first. And that's what made it so special. But we made the, uh, we made the, the quarterfinal. We were a, a week away from the semifinal. <laughs> And staggeringly, with 10 weeks we lasted. I mean, it's just the most brilliant thing in the world. And I remember that going into the semi-final, we were going to do two dances. And somebody said to me, uh, you've got two dances next week. What are your two dances going to be? And I said, similar. And it, she was just such a star. I can't tell you. <laughs> and of course, you're not only a judge and a fabulous dancer, you're an author as well. So tell us about the ballroom blitz. Well, uh, thank you so much for bringing it up. Um, it, <laughs> It's been a, a joy to have written it. It's the fifth one in the series. Yes. It's, oh, look, doesn't it look fabulous? I there love it that. Is. That's why I love, books. I love hard copy, hardback books, because they look so fabulous. Um, it's the fifth one in the series. Uh, and this one, the backdrop is the, uh, the Second World War and the Blitz specifically. And it's the goings on of the Buckingham Hotel, the continuing story of the Buckingham Hotel and all the characters involved, like Remedy Geese and Nancy Nettleton and Billy Brogan and um, what's going on in their lives and uh, in and around the hotel and the Hotel Ballroom, of course, the wonderful hotel with the Archie Adams Orchestra. Um, and so it, although it's a continuing story, it, it's still a standalone novel. So if you haven't read the others, you can read this one and, and not feel like you've missed anything out. But if you you know, you can always go back to the other ones as well if you haven't read them and, and enjoy those individually as well. Uh, my advice to you is buy the lot. All together <laughs> lot. as a the lot. series in, <laughs> yes. the box, in the box set. Any chance that someday it could, because we're all so obsessed with dancing shows that it would get the Bridgerton yeah. treatment? Oh, I have to tell you, nothing would make me happier than to come and film it in Ireland. I love that because it looks like fabulous. And I think it looks... Beautiful, and in my head, it's a it's it's a wonderful story, and it looks incredible with the hotel and the ballroom and the surrounding you know, areas and yeah. the, the wars going on, and it just looks so amazing. And I really do hope somebody picks it up and drums. We've had, we've been you know we have been in conversation with, with with different sort of people about the idea, and when we first sort of moved to the point. I don't think they felt that there was enough material yet in one book. So we know we've done five. Hopefully, moving forward, we might be able to get this going into um, a, a it, whole series. Nice. Yeah, a whole series. Yeah, no, and yeah. Anton, I love your writing process. So you don't go in right. and be on a keyboard tapping away for hours. You sit there right. and you just dictate it to somebody. <laughs> I love I it. A lot. I do this a lot. You do this a lot. Take around. this down, yeah. darling. Do it this way. Uh, I say, write this for me. I think. What? So I, I just um, somebody taps away from me as I as I wander around, sort of dictating the story. And because of that, I can see it in my head. It all plays out in my head. It's just the way I do it. A lot of people do it in different that's ways. How, I mean, that's how Stalin and I, and I, did it as well. Who? That's how Stalin did it as well. He gave. He just dictated to people. Are we talking about the, di the, the dictator? Star?
I'm Where just gonna go. Barbara Cartlin did it as well. Maybe she's the better I'm example. Yeah. Oh, is she? The first person that came to my head was like, that's what Stalin used to do. He wouldn't type anything himself. <laughs> I think maybe Barbara I'm Cartlin's not... more your type, dear. I, I, yeah, I don't think I don't think um, uh, Joseph Stalin ever had a feather boa and a chaise long. I think you. I think you'd be surprised. <laughs> To be oh, you know, I probably would be surprised. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I, but, <laughs> you know, you remind me of Joseph Stalin. <laughs> I do, I think. Come on. I bet you didn't I've think your that. interview was going to go that direction this morning, Anton. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I'm I'm I a bit dark, I have to be honest with you. Maybe it's volume 12 or something, the Stalin. You, you said know. the Blitz, and I've been reading about World War II oh, recently. Dear. It just popped into my Anton, head. Sorry, you know Anton. What? The Ballroom Blitz, as you said, the fifth one in your, in your series. Um, and once again, we it. are glued. Can I just ask you, what did you just put yeah. in the water last Saturday in Strictly? Everybody was fantastic, darling. I mean, what did Clyde, uh, uh, Clyde, who's Clyde? What did Craig say? He said they've been taking a dancing pill. He was absolutely right. It was ridiculous. One of the best weeks like that you normally get much later, normally after Blackpool or going into Blackpool zone, much later. This is like week three or four, isn't it? I can't remember. They're ridiculous. Yeah. Ridiculous. They won't be able to keep that up. I'm convinced they won't be able to keep that up. So we'll have to wait and see. I think every week from now on, the dance off is going to be a nightmare. Oh, it's yeah. going to be one of those where we're all going to be going. I can't believe they're. I mean, look at Kim in the dance off. I, know, yeah. I gave her nine. I gave her a nine. I thought she was brilliant. Yeah, she was in the dance off. But that's uh, that's the joy of Strictly, and that's the joy of having the audience voting, and that's why the audience at home voting is so important to the show. Absolutely. Well, and and it's a pleasure to, wa to watch the best judge in all the UK land, and uh, your book, The Ballroom Blitz, is out now. Thank I you like so much for joining. The world, you, the world, the world, yes. the world. Anton, lovely chatting to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Welcome back. Now, do you ever do a date night? Yeah, we try. Do you? Yes, yeah, sometimes. Carl wouldn't be mad into it now. It wouldn't anyway. be mad into it, but no. you like the nice fancy things. So yeah. we're going to find you something to wear for date night. Uh, Justine King is getting us all dressed up. Good morning to you. Good How morning. Are you? Very good, thanks. So we've different date night looks. Yes, exactly. And it can be date night with the girls. It doesn't have to be with your other half. But I wanted to show uh, something a little bit more smart casual. And then we've got super dressy towards the end. Okay, too. let's Love. start with Sarah. Yes, so Sarah, first of all, in a gorgeous monochrome look that I think is just perfect now coming into the Christmas season, but it's going to work year after year. And this whole look is from Beau Boutique, who are in Rohini and also online. Start off with this gorgeous top, because this is just absolutely stunning. It's free size, so it's going to fit kind of a 10 to a 16. It is that relaxed fit. And the cami underneath is an organic organic cotton cami that is sold separately. So oh, this okay. little top can just be worn over, say, a sleeveless dress if you wanted to cover up the arms, add a little bit something extra. You can see the beautiful craft work that's gone into that. And they have that in a charcoal and in a beige as well. So that's just an easy piece. Yeah, the side on. detail the, with the flowers, the way yeah. it kind of sticks out. It's lovely. It's stunning, isn't it? I just does think it, that's an easy Does it easy come piece. with the little cami top on? No, so that's sold separately. Oh, so you could okay. really put it over anything. If you have a little sleeveless right. dress or whatever, you could bring it up for winter in this. These trousers, I hope you can see the detail on screen. Stick they're, out your knee there, Sarah. They are a double layered yeah. chiffon with that slit up the front, but they're fully lined. So they're a really nice dressy alternative to wearing a long skirt or wearing the dress. If you are someone who prefers a trouser, really relaxed fit and they've got an elasticated waist as well. Very nice. The shoes now could be used for loads of things. They're stunning, aren't they? They're from Murphy Shoes. We're in Bantry and also online. They've got the little um, gold for loads detail. Of things, like what? I just thought they were very... <laughs> well, you can... To walk? <laughs> to I don't know. Walk, yeah. I'd well, use them for a run. You wear them with your dresses, with your trousers <laughs> or anything. But they have a gel insole Some as well. Some days so in the fashion really segments, I'm like, what words am I saying <laughs> no, I do love this neck piece. Yes. It's a Wow, isn't this it? This is stunning, isn't it? So this is from Corona Silver, another Irish brand. It's crystal handmade collar. So there's so much detail and handiwork gone into that. And it just catches in the light so beautifully. And then this gorgeous leather cuff from the same brand as well. That's all one piece. So it looks like you've stacked up all your bangles, but you can just take it on and off easily. And as you can see, it's got the gold, it's got pearl, it's got snake skin and everything going through it. So it's a beautiful leather you cuff. You separate it for loads of things. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just Thank wondering, I'm just trying to think what else now we could use the shoes for. <laughs> you apart from you you could use them if someone break it into your house to get them off for the head. It's a great heel. <laughs>
Uh, we have Sarah. Sorry, Sarah. <laughs> Sarah's is a little bit more smart casual, you know, for grabbing a casual bite to eat on a Friday night or whatever. This gorgeous poncho, again, from Beau Boutique in Rohini. This also comes in a black with a kind of a beige border on it too. And it's available in two sizes. So they do it in a kind of an 8 to a 14 and a 16 to a 20. So the poncho is, is here at the moment, isn't it? Yes. They're going, they're... Do you know what? It's a great thing if you are someone who thinks that knitwear adds a lot of bulk and a lot of bustier women find that. I find that across the bust. This is a great option because it's really flattering but you still get that kind of knitwear look. Oh, okay. So we've styled it over a crisp white shirt. I think you can't go wrong with a classic white shirt but it is hard to get a good one that isn't sheer, that's a nice fit that will wash and wear well. That so doesn't this is gape. your go-to. Absolutely. Oh, God, this is yeah. gorgeous. Uh, these wax effect, um, we're going to see a lot of leather in the next few looks because leather is back with a bang mm -hmm. but this is the wax effect um, trouser which is a nice way to do the kind of leather look trend without wearing actual leather, a lot more comfortable. Yeah. These are elasticated waist and they're high waisted so really comfortable option too. I was watching Weekend AM last week and they were going on about the smells of the of the yes. of the wax. So these definitely don't, these ones don't. These actually, don't smell. No. There we go. Okay, good so one. then these gloves are gorgeous little gloves. little gloves with the little pearl detail. But these also on the index finger means you can use your phone. They have a little a little thing on the index finger, which I think is a nice oh, really? little add-on for those. You don't have to take them off in the cold. Like there a little again. pad thing. Yeah, a little yeah. pad. Nice. Yeah, so it's great. Um, so onto our shoes then from what Murphy could you do Shoes. With these now? I, I don't. I was like, <laughs> stay away from the shoes. Yeah, these are a fabulous uh, little. 100% genuine leather and um, booty and then it's got the little embellished detail across the front as I well. I don't think Sarah could get them tied. Could you not get them tied before you commit? <laughs> they, they, they just open. Just they open. just open. Okay. They tie though. They tie though. But they're stunning with a dress, with your tights. You could really wear them with anything. Lovely. Yeah. Absolutely gorgeous. And so, some drop earrings. Gorgeous jewellery again from Corona Silver. So these are a gorgeous little gold huggy and then they have the long uh, pendant detail with the little mother of pearl too. They have them in a silver too if you're more of a silver kind of person. But I think they're just gorgeous and elegant to wear with any look. I've then gone for the necklace which kind of matches those too. It's got the little um, shell pearl and then it's got the little um, gold detailing too. So that just sits beautifully across the neck and it does have a T-bar closing. Lovely. Okay. Thank you Lovely so much, look. Sarah. Very nice. Cheers. Carrie's up next. Watch her walk carefully away, there keeping the boots on. Yeah. Well done, Sarah. <laughs> Hello, good morning. Carrie is up next and this look is from KC Dresses, so another Irish brand that are exclusively online. I love this cardigan because it's just one of those you could throw on with your daytime look, with your evening look. I've kind of gone for the 70s inspired look head to toe with this one. Yeah. And um, this one also comes in a magenta, so you could go for the pink on pink if you wanted to. It is one size, it's going to fit an 8 to a 16. Um, it comes with a little black leatherette belt as well, but I think just worn open and loose is a gorgeous way yep. to wear it. And I think that, you know, over a crisp white shirt as well workwear you could wear it with a you know well you can neck. throw it on as well when you're wearing leggings do you know That's what I mean what I this stage, like, absolutely it's everything comfort. extra warm and it's also stylish so then the trousers here again from KC dresses and um, they are almost oh, they're, they're lovely very similar to a Bottega Veneta pair that I saw on the catwalks that were a lot pricier because oh, wow. leather trousers really are making a massive comeback but this kind of cropped flared style is what we're seeing across the catwalks so the blouse then as well if Kerry just takes off the jacket we can show that off that picks up on the little chocolate brown going through it and it's mm -hmm. that gorgeous magenta shade and then I love that pussy bow effect too so it's very 70s yeah, those trousers are gorgeous aren't they they're the, really nice the key with leather trousers is they should fit like a glove yes. so that's what you want you don't want gaping you don't want bagginess they fit beautifully and they're nice and high waisted as now, well. Their boots, we're not going to say anything. Their lovely boots oh, were there as well. The we'll go the on to the earrings there. We're picking up on that pink again, and they're from Corona Silver too. And they are a handmade resin earring, and they come in a whole selection of colours too. Very nice, and a little break to bangle on So there. we have yeah. a little bangle, and this has the message on it that says, if it doesn't open, it is not your door. So it's a gorgeous kind of gifting piece that you might get for someone else coming up to Christmas now. And then the boots here, again from Murphy Shoes, so they are genuine leather as well. They're a gorgeous shade of a nude blush. And um, they've got the little zip on the inside for easy on off. And I just think those with any kind of yeah. straight leg trouser or dresses or anything, it's absolutely lovely. Gorgeous. If it doesn't open, it's not your door. Yeah, I think it's a great little saying. I haven't heard go, it before. But it is obviously one you might buy for someone else at the right time. Oh, it's a lovely Sarah dress. McGovern. Here, so this. we are starting off with this leather trench because Vogue have dubbed the leather trench as the coat of autumn winter 2022. So we've seen it at Chanel, at Acne, again at Bottega Veneta. This one is a little bit more affordable from Casey Dresses. Comes in a forest green as well, but that's just a gorgeous um, layering piece. And I think over something dressy like this we have for your dinner date, but you could wear that for oh, this a great This dress. is gorgeous. Yeah. So this is a showstopper of a dress. Absolutely stunning. It's already been a bestseller for Casey Dresses. So we're going on to the earrings. They are gorgeous um, little cat's eye gemstone, and I want to just bring a little bit of colour to the, to the look. But onto the dress then. 
beautiful shape. Oh, we're going to look at bracelet. Okay. okay. We might get to the dress <laughs> eventually. So the bracelet then, another, another gorgeous message here from Corona Silver, and it says, if you can dream it, you can achieve it. So a gorgeous one for gifting someone starting a new job, starting college. Um, and as I say, you could layer that up with lots of other bangles too. Now, are we going to the dress, guys? So, so the dress here, <laughs> absolutely stunning. So as you can see, the statement puff sleeve. Oh, no, we're going to the shoes. Okay. All right. So the shoes are from Murphy Shoes. Um, we've got their beautiful little um, gold not detail at the top. They come in black as well, and they've got a gel insole, so they're your really comfortable okay. shoe. We've seen the dress. So. <laughs> the dress, absolutely stunning. It's from Casey Dresses. Absolutely gorgeous if you had a winter occasion coming up. It's got the slit at the side, the beautiful statement puff sleeve, and then it draws you in at the waist, and then it has a zip detail all down the back. So I for the price point, that. isn't it stunning? It's beautiful. And really, Knock really it. flattering as well. Well done. Uh, that is absolutely beautiful. Justine King, thank you so much. Thanks well done. Million. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, now, time for a break. Tommy, what have you got after? Very nice, guys. You're going to both love this. From sealing your letterbox to placing tin foil. Do you know, actually, we better not give them all away, shall we? <laughs> okay. uh, yes, we're going to be giving you some DIY hacks on how to keep that heat inside your house. That's coming up after the break. Now, it's great to have you back. Our next guest DIY videos have had millions of views on TikTok. Now, DIY influencer Sean O'Connor is going to join me now with giving us some hacks on how to heat your home. I'm standing over here, Sean, because this is a really simple one. My windows leak like crazy. And what you've said to do just is to get plastic and some double-sided tape, is it? Yeah, so basically this is like a shrink wrap type of film. Um, so you, it acts as almost like a secondary glazing for a window. Okay. So you would pop it over the window, there's double-sided tape there, and you yeah. pull it, and just make sure... So just pull this all the way. the tape, yeah. Right, hold on there now. It's really easy, anybody could do this. And does it have to be pulled really tight? Yeah, so pull it nice and tight. Okay. Look, like, and that's really simple, isn't it? You're going to want to make sure it's really stuck to the tape. Yeah. And you might even let it cure for maybe 10, 20 minutes. And okay. then you're going to take a, a hairdryer. Do you want oh, the hairdryer? Oh, right, okay, all right. Pretend, Grab yeah. Grab the hair dryer. Shh, yeah. And <laughs> you're going to heat the wrap. So the wrap is going to tighten as it heats. So you're going to start from the top and work your way down to the bottom. Okay. And as you heat the wrap all over, it's going to tighten and it'll you'll be able to tap it afterwards and it'll be like and nice and hard. What is this plastic, just so people want to go and buy it? Is it a special name? It's 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 Insulating film for windows, yeah. Insulating film and double-sided tape yeah. and a hairdryer. And you can get this in most hardware Amazing. stores. Now, another thing I was really interested in is your chimney. 20% of heat loss can go up through the chimney. So you have a few different things that you can yeah. lug it, I suppose. So, especially coming into winter, I suppose, like, all year round, your chimney is acting like an open window. But yeah. coming into winter, you're going to have your drafts and they're going to, like, push warm air from the house up okay. into the chimney. So the best thing to do is to plug the chimney when the fire is not in use. So you basically pop this up the chimney and you can get this, this is a chimney sheep. And what I like about this is that it's breathable. So it's made from wool. So you still get that ventilation that you need. Okay, um, right. And you just pop it up. And then when you want to use the fire, you take it back down. Now you can also use um, a chimney balloon and you Put it up, you, it up, you inflate it when it's inside and you kind of pump it up and that'll also prevent air leaks and heat loss from the chimney. So you can save up to 20% on your heating bills. Okay, well, let's hope that the, this, these, because I have this at home, but I don't really know what to do with it and where to stick it. Yes, so this is an adhesive foam that you can put on um, around your windows and doors if you've got air leaks. So when you close your front door, for example, that's where I have mine, um, you might notice some drafts and air leaks. Yeah. And this, if you put this on, there's an adhesive backing on the back. It's really easy to install and it will prevent drafts from coming And in. do you stick it to the bottom of the door or where do you stick it? Kind of to the you back of the door? You stick it around the frame, as you can see there, how I have oh, it on yes. my door. So you can stick it around the door and onto the frame. So there where you can kind of see it is Brilliant. where I would have had a massive gap before and that's where the air was coming through. So it's prevented that. Now my door is airtight. That's really good. And you could do that in windows as well. You can do it on windows as well, yeah. And what about the silicone then? So silicone um, is great for around window boards. So if you run your hand around your window boards on um, a windy day, you might feel air leaks coming through. So if you silicone the joint between the window boards and the walls and also the window frame and the walls, then you will prevent air okay. from getting in and reduce your heat loss. Uh, very good. You've got the, the, this is going to block up your letterbox as well, which just seems so simple. It just means you're not going to get any junk mail, which is a double whammy. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about then the, the 
the radiator. So sticking a bit of tin foil almost so behind it. So we can lose up to 30% of our heat through external walls. It just pulls all that heat out. So if your radiator is on an external wall, it's going to pull the heat out into it. So you can put this radiator reflecting foil behind your uh, radiator and it, it'll basically reflect the heat back into the room so it's not being sucked out of the wall. And it's really easy to install. You just pop on. We can see, it. We can see the oh, clips yeah, of you your video here now. So it'll just hang on the bracket just like that. Right. Um, and you can also get some that stick onto the wall, but with this there's no need, it just hangs off the bracket. It's a really simple idea, like loads of really simple hacks, but amazing. And like we can al already see, I mean, millions of views on your TikTok as well, Shauna. We can see at home DIY diary. Yes. Congratulations to you. Thank you and so thanks much. so much for coming in. Now, a short one for you. Uh, and thank you to Luke and Windows and Doors for providing the window. I'll just get the hair dry on it next. Now, Alan, what's coming up tomorrow? Yeah, I loved your sound effect for the hairdryer, Tommy. <laughs> that was the best bit. <laughs> now, on tomorrow's show, broadcaster Angela Scanlon and writer Roshin Ingle will be here. Happy Plus, birthday to you. Oh, Happy look at this. birthday to you. It's the birthday boy as well. Oh, the birthday boy. Birthday. We're gonna do it all day. It's your birthday. <laughs> it is my birthday. Thirty today. Catherine, oh, yeah, thank you around? so much. Did Catherine make so this? Good. Yeah, she sorted you out. It's delicious. Oh, Look at that. I have Catherine. to blow them out. So. Look at that. Did you and make a wish? Go. You're I only a six. A thirty today, Tommy. A thirty, thirty, 30 today. today. Oh, let's everyone's let's everyone's exaggerating now. Sorry. Everyone's on Wikipedia going. Yeah. What about yeah. that? Oh, oh, thank you, Catherine. That's fabulous. Look at that. Happy birthday, Alan. Oh, oh, thank you so much. Thank you. He wished for two new co-hosts. That's oh, what he just yeah. said. <laughs> if I say it out loud, it won't come true. So we'll be here. We'll be back tomorrow. We're drinking red wines tomorrow. That'll be that'll help. Look at that. Then have a great day. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you very much for this lovely. Look at that.